What's up guys, Kevin Getz here from Mute Profit, helping you achieve musical success. So today, we're talking about kind of an interesting subtopic of audio engineering, which is how to mix symphonic metal specifically. And that's a little bit narrow for my tastes in making a video, but I've had enough of you ask me that I'm gonna go ahead and do this and we'll see what happens. First, I have to define a couple, couple things. Symphonic metal is a fascinating genre from a lot of standpoints, and I'm actually gonna be doing a few videos on this because why not? But from an audio engineering standpoint, it's incredible because no one has figured out how to mix it yet, at least not to a standard. With most metal subgenres, there are standards. There are things that you expect to hear mix-wise. With symphonic metal, that is just not the case. If you look at albums that came out around the same time, so compare Nightwish's Once to Epica's um, Consigned to Oblivion, okay? Completely different tonalities. Completely different. The guitar tone on Once is a fizzy, trebly, aggressive kind of sound, while the guitars on Consigned to Oblivion are dull and kind of weak. Generally, the one thing you can count on is that the bass guitar is incredibly loud in symphonic metal. Like Nightwish, most of what you think is the guitars is the bass. And that gives us our first reference point. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is that? The reason for that is because it's hard to balance the mid range on the guitars against the orchestra or, you know, keyboards, depending on what kind of symphonic metal band you are. And actually the recent popularity of Gent moving toward a very loud, aggressive bass tone gives us the exact same point where they use a distorted bass tone with boosts at around 700 hertz and 1500 hertz to add in an aggressive snarly mid range that in the case of Gent, they just want to overkill because the guitars already have a lot of that. In the case of symphonic metal, they've had to chop that out of the guitars to make room for the string sections and things like that. Another general point is that with symphonic metal, you're going to see the drums be very quiet compared to some other genres of metal where the drums are more upfront. And the reason for that is that they want to keep overall center track volume down. The goal is actually to keep the vocals as quiet as possible. And like, I know that's really weird. Like, why would you want the vocals quiet? You don't. You want to make enough space in the rest of the mix that you can have the vocals be low so they're not fighting the guitars. And to be clear, this is going to be part, you know, talking head video overview and part, yes, I am going to give you plenty of audio examples from different mixes that I have done. I would again reference uh, once or pretty much any of the, the Taria era Nightwish albums. The vocals are quiet, dude. Like Century Child and Once in particular, the vocals are quiet and they're relying on the top end like 10K air to kind of set it above everything else. And they also, of course, make holes in the guitars and other instruments around 3000, 4000 hertz. So the vocals can kind of come through without having to be on top of anything. Because in, in a lot of genres, it's totally acceptable to just plaster the vocals over the top of something. However, in symphonic metal, if you do that, it's not just about the fact that you're stepping on the guitars. The guitars already have everything else stepping on them. So, what you're basically doing there is you're making it impossible to hear anything but the vocals. See, the entire game changes when you're dealing with an orchestra. It, it screws everything up. There's, there's a reason most engineers hate mixing symphonic metal. And there's a reason that a lot of my students who come to me for audio engineering lessons end up actually just paying me to mix their symphonic metal albums. Because this is not easy. You know, this is top level stuff. I'm not saying by any means I'm a top level audio engineer. I'm just a very niche specialized audio engineer. I am damn good at symphonic metal because that's all I do. And you have to realize that's part of why there are no standards for symphonic metal mixing is because most of the engineers who work on it don't specialize in it. Every three or four years, they'll have a symphonic metal band approach them like, hey, we need our album mixed and they'll do their best. Okay, but they are not experts. They are not comfortable with symphonic metal. I, re I remember Andy Sneap. He's one of the best metal engineers out there right now. 
He mixed a symphonic black metal album. I can't remember which band that was. I want to say in like 2013, 2012. Anyway, he, he mixed a symphonic black metal album. And this, this guy is used to just really, really aggressive guitars. He got some of the best guitar tones in the business. And he couldn't... He had a really bad time with it. I remember him venting on his forum like, yeah, the, the band really wanted the orchestra to be dominant and I, you can't have it both ways. There's just no way. And that's the frustration of a lot of symphonic metal engineers, or rather I should say engineers who are forced to make symphonic metal. You end up with one of two problems. Either the guitars are way too dull and it's just not an interesting mix to listen to, or you go overboard with the top end and you don't boost, you don't get enough clarity out of the mids. And so what you hear is a lot of beautiful orchestrations with <laughs> over it from the guitars, because that's it. That's all the power chords come down to is because <laughs> there's no mids to tell you what the note is because the orchestra is eating up all the mids. So what I recommend, what usually as a recipe works well for me is to cut around 4K on the guitars, because 4K is garbage. And you're gonna make smaller cuts at around 3K and 2K for the vocals. 4K needs to get the fuck out. That, that ruins a symphonic metal mix. And then you can actually boost a little bit around 5K to bring some of that top end fizz back in without it ruining things. Like, I chop 4K. If you look at my EQ curve, it's like, there's a straight line, there's like some dips, some dips, 4K. It is just fucking gone. I cut like 10 decibels sometimes. And the reason for that is that ensemble strings, as well as a lot of brass, use 3.5 to 4K to pierce through. And now we're getting into the interesting bits. So there's a weird effect that happens when you're trying to keep something in the background of a mix which is what you want with, with the orchestra because it's, it's usually gonna have a good hall reverb on it and it wants to sound full and behind everything. So what that necessitates that you cut a bit of is around 800 and 1500 on the guitars because for whatever reason, those frequencies clash with the orchestra a lot and make it kind of covered up. I've seen a couple of engineers refer to the 1500 especially as it kind of controls the guitar's perception of being front to back, where if there's less of it, the guitars are more forward. So like, say the guitars are like out here. This, this represents the front of your mix. Less 1500, more 1500. The guitars span more toward the back of the mix with more content at 1500. It kind of screws with the, the 3D sense of it. And it's actually safe to boost a little bit of that in the orchestra, since you're, you're cutting it in the guitars and you want the two to be complementary. So you can also boost around 4K slightly, don't go crazy with this or it'll sound horrible, on your strings to get that kind of piercing singing high on like a soaring string section. Trumpets work the same way. A lot of the, I don't know the word for it, I guess the bite? In, in horns and brass sections comes from around 4 to 5k. But, you know, by far the hard part here is getting the low mids of the guitars right, and this is what most people haven't figured out yet. And I'm not saying I'm a master at this by any means, but, I mean, I think my mixes speak for themselves. You can hear everything, clearly. So, what actually, actually, the way I realize this, because I'm going to go on a brief little derail for a split second here, is that... I actually wanted to do some Nightwish covers, okay? And these Nightwish covers that I did, I wanted to emulate as much as I could the sound of the original album's mix. So I just, you know, mixed by ear, tried to kind of copy the EQ style of the guitar tones and copy the, the mix to the best of my ability. And it kind of gave me a sense for the different types of viable guitar tones. And so what I realized was none of the pre-existing guitar tones are satisfying factorally clear when you're doing crazy riffs that are not just power chords. And it kind of gave me a flashback, you know, I remember when I was first learning guitar, it was like my first year of playing, I was trying to learn Nightwish songs by ear, and, you know, like Dark Chest of Wonders or pretty much anything off of Dark Passion Play as well, 
I would be listening to like a dense section and just thinking, what the hell is he playing? Am I just bad? Can I just not hear it? Do I just not understand? I, th I would think I understand. And turns out, no, not my fault. It was the mix. Because all you could hear was Now on to some more general ideas. I mentioned the drums need to be quiet. Your snare is going to have some punch at around 200 and some top end like string smack at around 10,000, a little bit, do like a subtle boost there. And then a trick that not a lot of people do, actually boost around 400 to 500 in the snare itself a little and then crank that area in the snare's reverb if you have a short plate reverb. And it adds kind of this ping. Um, not in like an ugly blast beat kind of way, but in, but it just kind of helps the reverb itself come through more pronounced. With the kick drum, you want some bass thump at around 120, some bass thump at around 80 to 60, and you make small little holes in the bass guitar for those. Don't go crazy here. If you, if you cut too much from the bass guitar, it just sounds bad. And then a little bit of click at around 3k and a lot of kind of the, the slappier click at around 6k. You know, adjust to taste, obviously. And what these allow you to do, if you EQ the snare and the kick this way, is that they can sound powerful and centric and present without overwhelming the vocals, which is the important part. And with some mixes and some snare samples, it's gonna take a lot of boosting around 200 to get the snare to actually have meat to it. You know, if, if especially if you're recording your snare instead of sampling it, it's a lot of the time you, the drummer hits the snare just psh, psh. That's it. That's the sound of a snare. That's bad. That means you need a lot of boosting at 200 hertz, and obviously like a low pass at 10,000 or something. The hardest part of all this to explain, because I know people are going to take this the wrong way. You need to EQ the master bus. You need to put EQ on your master master bus and crank the top end up around like 10,000, 12,000, 14,000, sometimes down to 8,000. That whole thing needs to just be elevated. Use your ears very carefully. Listen to a reference mix. Listen for the hi-hats and listen for the kind of airy shimmer on the vocals as your reference point. Because you can go overboard with this. You can turn your snare and kick right back into psh if you do this wrong. But those particular instruments, if you boost those high frequencies, you can set the kind of commercial level of what they call air. Because it is standard practice to boost the high end. This is usually saved for mastering when you, when you send your mixed song out to a mastering engineer. However, they can't work miracles, and I, in my opinion, if I'm going to mix something, I want to be mixing it to the most accurate representation I can. So, you know, if I mix it so that the hi-hat sounds at the proper level, and then I have to add 12 decibels of 10k, guess what? The hi-hat is fucked. <laughs> That's all you can hear at that point. But it is this added air that allows your mix to really breathe and kind of separate because when everything's clumped up in the mid-range without anything going on at the top, everything fights and everything gets claustrophobic and bad. And adding this air allows breathing room. It kind of separates everything out. It almost feels like it creates more stereo space than you had. Now, I briefly touched on the bass guitar. And there's a trick for this you might not know that is very important to use. You're going to clone your bass. You're not just playing one track. You're playing two and you... You don't, it's not like double tracking with guitar where you play it twice, you just copy and paste. And you're gonna add an instance of EQ to both. One of these gets high pass all the way up at 200 hertz, and a low pass around, I don't know, 5000 or something. And this gets distorted. I use the plugin No Amp for this. And this is gonna be your gritty, snarly, distorted bass track and you want to boost 700, 1500, maybe 500 tastefully. Be careful of 200 though, because that can get muddy with this. And then the other one is not distorted. That actually gets 
low passed at 200. So all that is, is the base itself, the low end. You cut a bit at 120, probably cut a bit at 80, make room for the kick, calm it down a little, and then compress the shit out of it. And you know, you can Google bass guitar compression settings or whatever. I'm not going to give you specific recommendations here because it's kind of dependent on your mix and your taste, but that's how you get a good bass sound is splitting it into two tracks, set the volumes independently, set the EQs independently. And that way, so you've got the low end just being the foundation of the track, and then you've you got your grit track cranked up to complement the guitars. Uh, what else? French horns are an interesting one. Their note tends to sit at around 200 hertz, which is generally something we don't want in our mix. It can sound muddy. But again, if you have them sent to a good hall reverb, the reverb kind of takes it and shapes it in a much more pleasant way. So don't be afraid to boost a little bit of 200 if you're having trouble hearing the quality of the horns. Like, it's hard to describe. French horns to me have always sounded kind of mournful and like singing almost with their, their note. You know it if you hear it, I think. Um, if your horns feel like they're lacking something, it, it might be that. Give that a try. It could also be they need a boost around 10k because they tend to be dull if they're sampled. Overheads, you're usually going to put a high pass at like 500 hertz, cut out a lot of the low mids because they can sound very boxy. And then there's some boosting around 7,000, 10,000, whatever. And probably some cuts in the vocals range, 2k, 3k. It's pretty simplistic, really. Just make sure, make sure you're sending your overheads and your hi-hat gently to a reverb of some sort, like a drum reverb. Not the same reverb as your snare, because your snare probably wants a bit more of it, but totally dry upfront cymbals tends to sound bad in this kind of arrangement. You have to be very conscious of reverb on everything, because you have so much more perceived 3D space because the orchestra is using reverb to sound way further back than it could without the reverb. So it kind of expands the potential soundscape way further. It's, it's literally like the room you're playing in has been expanded. And so you have to pay a lot of attention to all the instruments and where they are in that room. Now, I saved vocals for last because that's probably the hardest thing to explain because it's so easy to screw up. And depending on your style of vocalist as well, that's that's also why this is so hard is if you have a more like belty vocalist, kind of a Floor Janssen, Simone Simmons kind of thing, it's an entirely different set of rules than if you have like a Taria operatic style vocalist. But in general, I'll do my best. So 2,000 to 3,000 is natural for the vocals. And I don't boost it. Some people do. I find that it tends to sound nasally. So I just let it be at, at unity, zero. Um, I don't cut it at all. I would never dream of cutting that region, except in one instance. There's one case where to fit the vocals to a mix, I had to do some weird EQing. I was trying to kind of knock off the Century Child mix style with less crazy bass. The vocals just weren't feeling warm enough. So what I did was I boosted around 700 hertz with a wide curve. It was a curve of like one. And I, I boosted this way too far until the vocals sounded kind of muffled and pillowy. And then I brought it back. And that can kind of accentuate and bring out a hint of that operatic warmth if your singer already has it. And then I did a similar wide boost between like 1500 and 3000 just to make the vocals come forward slightly more. But in general, if your master EQ, as I recommended, right, you might also need to boost a bit of 3000 in your master EQ, not just the 10,000 area. And some people like to boost the bass as well. Um, I, I'm not going to speak to that. Do what you, what you want. <laughs> This is all just to taste, and this is all carefully listening to reference mixes for getting as close to what you like to hear as possible, so you, you're not just getting stuck in your own head, stuck in your own echo chamber of a flawed mix. You need reference mixes, it is so important. But anyway, if you have your master EQ set properly, usually you won't have to mess with the vocals too much, because 
all the air and shit that they need is coming from the master already. That's kind of the, the cheat so that you can tell exactly how the master should be set is to listen to the vocals and go, wow, that sounds like a professional vocal recording. It doesn't sound like it was muffled or in a closet at all. It sounds all airy and sweet and nice. You're good. Fit the rest of the instruments to that. And that's how you do it. So as I said, I'm probably going to do a few more videos on this. This was just a brief overview on just some of the most difficult instruments to get right. Please, please comment if you have any questions. I love talking about this. And, uh, yeah. See you in the next video.